Number 1. Michael Lawrence Limison, age 27, went missing from Freeport, Illinois on May 25, 1985. He was last seen by his friend, David Bell. According to David, he and Michael had visited a local McDonald's, then went to Nate Park to talk. David then dropped Michael off at his apartment at 941 Watts. Stevenson Street at 7.45 p.m. At about 8.30 p.m., his mother tried to call him, but was unable to reach him. Although she was not immediately concerned by this, it is now believed that he vanished some time between 7.45 and 8.30 that evening. Because it was Memorial Day weekend, he wasn't due to report for work at Microswitch until Tuesday. His employer contacted his family when Michael did not call or show up, and it was at this point that his family became concerned and contacted police. Michael's car was found parked near his apartment, it contained letters that he had agreed to mail for his sister. In his apartment were his credit cards, checkbook, an uncashed paycheck and his clothing. His bank accounts had not been accessed. According to Namus, he may have traveled to Dubuque, Iowa, however I can't find any indication of why they think that. According to this article from a 1977 issue of the Freeport Journal Standard, Michael was in the Marines at the time, serving at the Marine Corps Air Station in Cherry Hill, North Carolina. This was eight years prior to his disappearance. It's been over 32 years. He needs to be found. Number 2. Amy Sue Clements, age 14, was last seen sometime between late 1980 and mid-1981. She was originally from Niles, Michigan, but in 1980, she moved with her father and stepmother to Lincoln, Nebraska. Tammy had not been in Nebraska long when her father announced that they would be moving back to Michigan. Tammy was upset over this and did not move back. Instead, she stated that she was going to travel to California with an unknown friend. Tammy left and her family moved back to Michigan. Tammy was never seen or heard from again. Tammy was only recently reported missing and many of the adults in Tammy's life at the time are now deceased and those who are still with us do not recall all the details due to the fact that they were young at the time. It is believed that Tammy's friends were people she worked with at an unknown chicken fast food restaurant. Attempts to identify her place of employment and co-workers have been unsuccessful so far, but her family believes they may have known who she planned to leave with. I've researched as many chicken restaurants associated with Lincoln as I could find. Of the places that currently exist, it appears that only KFC and a family-owned establishment called Lee's Chicken existed then. Lee's is located at 1940 Van Dorn. It was, and still is, a very popular place. I've passed along some info to Tammy's stepsister in the hopes that the surviving owner might recognize her as having worked there. I know it was a long time ago and they've undoubtedly gone through zillions of employees since then, but if she did take off spontaneously with other employees, it could stick out in their minds that a few employees were suddenly gone. There has been no activity on her social security number in the ensuing years and she has not obtained a driver's license in her name. Her surviving family continues to search for answers. Number 3. Debra Ann Quimmy, age 13, was last seen in Townsend, Massachusetts on May 3, 1977. Debra was last seen riding her bike along Route 119. She had left a note for her parents, indicating that she was going to her grandfather's campsite by Vinton Pond and that she had some issues to deal with and would call home later. She never arrived at the campsite and never called. The bike ride would have been approximately four miles from her home on Smith Street to the campsite. A friend accompanied her about halfway before turning back at Route 118 and Turnpike Road. This is the last known sighting of her. Another note was discovered that she had left for a friend. This note, which was found in a school locker, included a map to the campsite, and Deborah wrote that she was upset and wanted to talk to this friend. It is unknown whether the friend had received it prior to her disappearance. Police have followed tips that led them to search Walker Pond. Remnants of a bicycle were found, along with some pieces of clothing, but they were determined not to belong to Deborah. The main tips that led to the search of the pond came in the form of repeated anonymous letters, urging them to look there. The letters were postmarked from New Hampshire. Although the letters were considered credible at the time due to the specific information contained in them, the letters are now believed to be a hoax. It was since discovered that several cold cases from around the country involved similar letters originating in New Hampshire. An article from January 2014 states that recent interviews have revealed some inconsistencies and they felt like the case was moving forward. There have been no updates since then. There was some speculation that Deborah was pregnant, but that is not confirmed. Both Deborah and her brown boy's bicycle remain missing. One article states that she was last seen by two boys and that she told them she was running away, but I've found no other source for this detail. Number 4. Andy Joe Lepley, age 18, went missing from Crow Junctium, Colorado on May 30, 1976. Andy, who was also known as Joe or Taco, was about to graduate from high school. In a little over a month, he would also celebrate the bicentennial. 
Maybe he would follow in his father's footsteps into the construction trades, or maybe he had other plans. Joe arrived at work early that morning at the Kanoko gas station in Crow Junction, at the intersection of Highway 25 and Highway 165, and as was his routine, he opened up a store and delivered a newspaper to the adjoining restaurant. He was seen by a couple waitresses. He then headed back to the store and was never seen again. Police were called when customers found the gas station unattended. They found a CB microphone had been ripped from the wall, and the cash register was empty. His car remained in the parking lot. The waitresses recalled seeing a man in the restaurant earlier that morning, waiting for the gas station to open. He mentioned to the waitresses that he was headed to Wyoming. They also noticed a pickup truck that they believed was his. It had what appeared to be a handmade covered trailer. He left the restaurant, presumably to get gas, as soon as Joe arrived and opened the station. It is not known whether this man had anything to do with Joe's disappearance. Police have long suspected that Charles Humphrey, a then-college English professor, was involved in Joe's disappearance. It's unclear why he was suspected, but here is what is known about Humphrey. Charles Humphrey married Lucilla, sometimes referred to as Lucille or Lucy, and they had several children. Lucilla went missing just days before Joe did, also under suspicious circumstances her remains were found in 1981, she was found to be the victim of a homicide. Charles had obtained a divorce from Lucilla in 1977, while she was still missing, and he then married Bonnie Lee. They divorced in July 1979, and Bonnie also died under suspicious circumstances in December 1979. Law enforcement had become suspicious now that he had two wives die suspiciously. As law enforcement moved in to arrest him, he committed suicide. A search was done of 55 Glenmore Road, the property where Charles Humphrey had lived at the time of Lucy's and Joe's disappearances. Law enforcement states they had reason to believe Joe was buried in or under the abandoned septic tank. The dig of the septic tank revealed a hammer and a shovel, but no body was found. Family of Joe Lepley believed that a group of men from Rye, who had committed several robberies in the area, were responsible for Joe's disappearance. I can't quite piece together why Charles Humphrey was a suspect. Obviously, he wasn't a good guy. He more than likely killed both of his wives. But I'd think those crimes were crimes of passion anger rage. I wouldn't necessarily link that to the abduction and murder of a gas station attendant, who there's no evidence that he even knew. Perhaps there is some connection that we don't know about. Could Joe have seen something related to the murder of Charles's wife? Did Charles possibly suspect his wife of having an affair with Joe? I hope the suspicion is based on more than the time frames. Otherwise, the theory doesn't make much sense to me. I happened to do a quick search today, in case any news had surfaced between the time I researched this case and now. I didn't find any new updates on Joe's case, but sadly I found this recent obituary. Joe's father, Bob, passed away within the last month. My heart goes out to his family. Joe's mother, siblings, and many friends are still alive, and I'd love to see them get some answers. Number 5. Louise Lamona Romero, age 52, went missing from Starks, Louisiana on January 14, 1992. She was last heard from by phone when she spoke with her adult children. Louise, who was known as Dottie, was upset during the conversation over a dispute with a family member. She did not seem upset enough to disappear on her own, however. An unknown witness claimed to have seen her running down the road later that night during a thunderstorm. It's unclear which road she was seen on, her residence was on Smith Cutoff Road, and she lived alone. She may have been wearing a red skirt, red pants, or pajamas. Dottie was spontaneous and adventurous, so she had a history of dropping out of sight for brief periods of time, but it always returned. Oddly, after her disappearance, her home appeared to have been tampered with. Photos of family members had been rearranged, and it is not believed that Dottie did this herself. An open Bible was found on the coffee table, along with a couple coffee mugs. There's no indication of whether the door was found unlocked or if any windows were open. The multiple cups of coffee might suggest that she'd opened the door for someone she knew. Some of Louise's relatives suspect that Louise's brother may have information about her disappearance. When questioned, he reportedly told law enforcement that she had been seen in Texas, but was unable to provide any source for this sighting. According to the Facebook page for Louise, her brother has worked in law enforcement and later became a funeral director. This has led to a theory that her remains could be very well hidden. I'm not going to name her brother here, but his name can be found in this Facebook group run by her family. Look for the images of documents that are posted there. Her children describe her as a great mom, and they continue to seek answers. There is a headstone for her, although she does not appear to have legally been declared dead. The gravestone gives her last name as Smith.